G'day, it's Mike and I'm climbing the 10 highest peaks in Australia. I'm with my two kids on a seven day unsupported trek along the spine of the Snowy Mountains, the highest and largest alpine wilderness area in the country. Good one, bunny rabbit. I got it, yes. Full of snakes right here. Okay, so we've just set off from the car. My mum has dropped us off and we're hiking over the next seven days to Threadbow via the 10 highest peaks in Australia. I've actually started this well back from the main range, just so my kids, Tom and Zara, can get a longer hike. Um, I also want to teach, particularly Tom, because he's showing interest in how to learn how to navigate. So Tom's 15, uh, Zara's 13, and I reckon once Zara sees Tom navigating, she'll want to have a crack as well. The first few days aren't as dramatic from a scenery perspective. We're below the tree line. We're not up on the really high mountainous areas with the big, broad views. But there is still plenty of beauty if you look closely. So there's no phone coverage here, but to save on battery, because I'm gonna be pulling it out and using the camera in it and stuff, when I get into remote areas, I put it in airplane mode, which is a bit of a no-brainer. But I also turn off background app refresh, so if I do get in range, it's not continuously burning battery and data. So I also put the screen on dark permanently, so the display is shining less and therefore using less battery. The kids' packs weigh about 11 and a half kilos, which is 25% of their body weight. They're also carrying two days each of our group food and all of their own personal belongings. I'm carrying 26 kilos, of which six kilos is camera gear, a solar panel and power banks and I'm carrying three days of our group food, plus the tent and all the cooking gear and all my own personal yeah, stuff. These burrs stick to everything, socks, clothing, whatever. Where is it? It's on your hat. Yeah, oh, on the sole, on the hat. <laughs> oh, nice work. <laughs> You're not funny. So it holds the high ground. Stop. Bro, there's pricklies all over me. <laughs> Look. So it's good practice while hiking to flick them around and get stuck everywhere. That way you can enjoy them underneath your pack straps as you hike. The itchy bomb fights are continuing. It's also pretty remote out here. Not a lot of people walk these tracks. And one of the nice things about this section below the tree line is that there's huts left over from the cattle days up here from hundreds of years ago, and also the mining days. Most of these huts are empty, but because this one's only a day's walk from the road, we find people in it. A mother and a daughter doing an overnight hike, and then another guy just joined us as well. So yeah, maybe one night in 10, I find the huts up here have other people in them, but mostly you just have them to yourself. Everyone you meet up in places like this is uh, a nice and interesting to talk to. Check out this massive lichen. Never seen one quite like that. That uh, wasn't a bad night. It rained last night. Lovely weather, children. <laughs> Unfortunately, my main camera died. Camera is stuffed. It started playing up on the very first day. Making a horrible noise, I think, from the optic stabilizer in here and now it's completely cactus. So I'm limited in that regard, and I also can't use drones because it's a national park. I think drone restrictions are completely unnecessary in New South Wales national parks. They don't have them in Queensland and they don't have any problems. National parks don't own airspace and park users are generally respectful people and they're not gonna intrude on other people's privacy or hover around their heads to annoy them. It's just an unfortunate photography restriction on people who have a right to use the airspace above parks for their own pleasure and share the beautiful things that they are able to film on their drones. We're just approaching a hut for lunch and we're doing 17 kilometers today, which isn't a huge amount, but I want the kids to enjoy it and just have a bit of time out. We'll probably have an hour and a half for lunch. I'm reading a book about a guy he stayed at the hut I'm just about to be at in December 2019 as the black summer bushfires were beginning. He didn't know that though. But he describes ash and 
burnt leaves falling to the ground as he walked along this trail and it just he had an ominous feeling and he sheltered in this hut for a while and I'm still reading the book <laughs> so I don't know what ended up happening but I think it ended up in some kind of rescue. What? They have bunk beds in here. Triple layer. Awesome. I want to see this. Yeah, I love this art. It's one of my faves. Look at the view. Yeah. And from the campfire, if you sit there. Yeah, this is a bit great. Right. I wish we could just stay here tomorrow. Well, last time I was here, it was snow everywhere. I had a stereo. <laughs> and I sat up and I was listening to music on that shelf. We can't use that wood for a fire, can we? No, we'll collect our own wood. Yeah, you can set it if you want. I'll give you a lighter and you can do it. Can you help me get firewood? No, you can do it. You'll be right. Pretty modern looking dunny. I'd say the bushfires must have burnt down. The last one. Standard kind of drop dunny. So Kosciuszko National Park never used to have a Z in it. It was named after Kosciuszko, some guy from Europe or Poland or something. And then they added, like only 10 years ago, a Z. It was, it was hard enough to spell as it is, but you can tell something's new when it's got a Z in the name. <laughs> I always prefer the old spelling. So the kids are keen to camp here for the night. And I must admit, I am tempted because the weather is pretty rubbish. It's supposed to be rubbish for the next couple of days. And this would mean that tomorrow night we're definitely in the hut as well. As we were packing for this trip, it absolutely poured down at my mum's place and those kinds of storms are in the forecast at the moment so i am tempted and plus it's the kind of the kids idea so it is nice to stay in a place when it's kind of their idea and also i mean this is just a beautiful remote hut with a beautiful view and this is why you come out to these places and in some ways it's kind of not surprising that there was people in the hut last night because it's a day walk in but now we're two days in and this is one of the most remote huts in the high country up here so that's nice too, just feeling remote and having a beautiful view and hanging out with your kids. It's going to be awesome and there's an awesome open fire pit as well. It's a real luxury to have a good book to read on a hike like this. You have a lot of time to think, so it's nice to mull over your own thoughts, but also get perspectives from other people and their journeys through life. I'm particularly enjoying this book. It's about a guy walking the Australian Alps walking track, which is a 660 kilometre hike through the Victorian Alps and then the New South Wales Alps all the way to Canberra. Now he was here when the Black Summer bushfires hit and he was evacuated from a nearby hut. What I find interesting about this guy's perspective is that he has been coming to these mountains like me since he was a little kid. And it's devastating for people who've seen the snowies for decades and decades to see the amount of damage that's happened from these severe bushfires, which unfortunately just happen under the Western land management regime, where we don't reduce the undergrowth and there is so much fuel that the fires burn so hot and they burn all the way across the country, all the way to the coast in the case of the last one. So I really hope that we can adopt Aboriginal land management techniques where they not only reduce the amount of undergrowth, but optimise it for plants and animals that are native to Australia. There's no doubt climate change played a role in the last fires, but more than ever, we need Aboriginal land management techniques to reduce the kind of damage that's going to happen with climate change. I was just sitting here quietly and I saw movement. You can tell it's a hare because it's got much bigger ears than a rabbit and they're larger. I find them more wary than rabbits. He's upwind of me so he can't smell me and unless I move quickly or the wind shifts he's not going to know I'm here. Oh there he goes. Is that the wind? The wind was just swirling as I said that and he caught a whiff and then he had her off. Nothing fancy tonight. Beef ravioli. Mind you, this is a fresh meal. So the first two nights I'm going freshies. And then after that, it's just cheap, dry stuff. Look at these gas cylinders. This is an expensive one. And it says, four season performance. In summertime, you don't need that because it's warm enough that the gas just evaporates enough to be used anyway. So I'm just using this one up. That's the only reason I'm using it now. But otherwise, just use these cheap ones from Kmart, they're like four bucks fifty, it's like a third of the price. Squirty sauce. 
So I've been trying to figure out how this machinery works for this, I think, gold mine, right? So I reckon this machine spun this wheel and rotated those rock crushing bits. And I reckon this spinning bits to crush the rocks was housed in those big metal things there, maybe fed down a chute like that. <laughs> and this is a large flywheel that probably added inertia to the rock crushing. And these things look like pistons and I don't know quite where they fit in, which maybe that's, maybe that's the engine block, I don't know. But the whole thing would have been mounted down here, I reckon, on these supports using the water from the river. And you can see all up and down this little creek, there's tailings left over from this mining process. And the rocks would have been carried in that thing before it went into the crusher. It's interesting that the whole lot is spread out really widely over about a 50, 60 meter area. That would have taken a lot of work to do. So I wonder whether the person that left the mine destroyed it so nobody behind him could use it. No idea. But this is obviously the hut where they worked. Not bad having a water source right there. Tom's taking quite an interest in photography at the moment. I like the bug one too. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a nice one. Go back to that one. Yeah, no, no. no. That, that one. So I'm also showing him how I shoot star lapses on my GoPro. Each frame, you know how I said there's 25 frames per second. Because there's so little light outside, I'm going to have the shutter open for 30 seconds to allow enough light to get in to get a picture of the stars. So it's going to take... 30 seconds is one frame. One frame. So I'm going to need 25 times 30 seconds to get one second of footage. So 750 seconds. Yeah. Mount Jigungal over there has just got some fog just wisping over the top. Ha! <laughs> Blue sky day. I've learned a fan of always following tracks, so I'm actually thinking about the track goes off around there in a big kind of S turn and I'm thinking about going across there and then a shortcut up a very sharply contoured heavily wooded area which is generally a recipe for disaster but there are some waterfalls marked on the map there and it'll be good for the kids to <laughs> have a crack at what a disaster looks like and also just I'll show them before we do it what the contours look like. deer tracks lots of them and that's a new addition to our alpine areas well since the 1800s they've introduced deer but recently the deer numbers have been going absolutely nuts so you can catch a bloke a um, marsh fire tom and feed it to that skink so once he sees it moving he'll grab it i reckon oh you can i oh, got it yes <laughs> Look, he's eating it. How awesome. He's like, thanks, human. It's hard for me to catch these things. Can you squat that one up on my bum, please? Just having a hard time getting it down. Oh, yep. Yeah. Get it down there, mate. Good work. Getting down the river was okay. And even getting it across the river was easy enough without even taking our packs off. But on the other side, we came across a whole bunch of snakes, basically. They're just underneath the bushes everywhere. And this one was right in the middle of my path. And as I tried to move around just another three meters to my left to avoid that snake, I came across another one. So I had to take measures. This place is full of snakes right here. So these are normally to keep the birds out of your socks. My boots go to there, but I'm just gonna put these on as an added layer of protection in case I get struck 
up here. And we're going right through this stuff which is knee high. And I just saw two snakes just in the last three or four meters. And oh, it's just the sound reflecting off that rock there. <laughs> this is a song that the kids made up in Nepal and um, they decided to sing it because I said to make noise so they're making noise to help scare the snakes off now on the other side of the ridge I reckon the snake wrist just went down a bit because it's dewy here see how wet my boots are and it's cold and I reckon all the snakes in the area have gone to the other side of that knoll to warm up in the sun and check that waterfall out, spectacular. I just hope we can get around it. So the plan is to go to that middle of that clear ridge there and then assess whether to go up that side, around the far side of the waterfall, or go up this side. We're gonna try going straight up this ridge line here. Really thick undergrowth like this not only provides extra fuel for severe bushfires, but it prevents grass growth underneath it, thereby starving out the animals that would be eating grass. And it is so thick that it prevents animals from being able to move through it. A kangaroo simply cannot bounce through this stuff. They can try and crawl underneath it and stuff, but basically this is just a no-go area. There's no, it's too hard to move through and there's no point being there because there's no food. <laughs> this is gonna be a long climb. All right, the bushes are over my head now. So I literally have to part them <coughs> with my hands. Probably not. There ain't no clearance. It's just gonna be a s absolute suck fest the whole time. <sighs> Their bushes are all angled like like a barb, so you're going up the grain. Like falling logs like this are kind of helpful because they push it down. No yeah, hang on. Yeah. Thought it would get easier, it's actually getting worse. <laughs> I don't know if you can see how many. <laughs> Sand flies there are, but they are just everywhere. <laughs> These little ferns, you can eat them when they're in this stage here. It's called a fiddlehead stage. You get better off boiling them first though. This looks like an alpine version of Dianella that just aren't ripe yet. I've never seen that size. I'll have to look it up when I get access to the internet again. That's also called the flax lily. Good for making string, but um, normally those berries go blue and you can eat them and they taste really good. That there's a witchetty grub hole. You can see that's the sawdust that the grubs left behind. So if you had an axe, uh, this is a national park, you're not allowed to do this any, even if I have one. But uh, you cut in here and the grub would be up there. In fact, you can make a little hook on a stick, shove it up the hole and drag it out. But um, we're puffing and panting going on this hill, so I think we're better off just keeping going. This is a bloody struggle, epic struggle up here. But I can just see the base of a big granite cliff face which we spied from the bottom and I think that is the top. Oh. Oh, that was an absolute prick of a climb. You right? If, it, if it's too dodgy, just don't come up, okay? So that's where we bushed bashed up from. It was a shocker. The fun wasn't over there yet either because we had to bush bash down to another river and then back up the other side. On the plus side we managed to have a swim because we were covered in leaves, sweat and twigs. That was a pretty epic morning actually. That was tough going up that hill. Can you close it behind me please Tom? Ooh, Valentine's heart. Two minute noodles. You can't really go wrong with two minute noodles, can you? Yeah, and you've also already had some. I've only had like four strings.
The last time I'd been here was a solo ski trek in wintertime, and it was before the bushfires, and it was surrounded by trees. It was actually hard to find because the track was covered in snow, and the trees had a dense foliage. Now the entire place has a different feel. Yesterday, it kind of seemed arduous walking on a track, but after walking up that horrible ridge through all the bush, the track seems like an absolute luxury. That's how the kids are saying it, and I feel the same way, which is a good reason to go and do random stuff like that. Well, it's been quite a day, but it's nice to have one last hut before we head up into the real high country above the tree line, and it'll be all tent from then on. The Schlink Hilton, as it's affectionately known, due to the size of this hut, was built in the 60s as part of the Snowy Hydro Scheme. It's now unused and available to use for hikers. Yeah, that's right. It's been a while since it's been. Oh, comfy, bumpy. Woo! Butter chicken. What do you think of your real chicken pieces? Only got like three. Mm -hmm. I think there was about four in a whole packet. <laughs> As after being exploited. You can complain to the Human Rights Commission. Weather can change very quickly here, and I'd been expecting it to get bad, and it looked like it was about to finally catch up with us just as we left the protection of the huts and headed up onto the higher ground of the main range over the following days of the trip. Alrighty. Setting off, it's a bit of a dreary old day, I tell ya. It was whited out down to the hut when I first woke up. So we're actually heading up now into that white out. <laughs> yeah, it's not looking real nice. At least it stopped raining for a second. These are the last trees we're gonna see for the next four days before we head off into the white out. Worst thing about hiking through this stuff is you just basically get wet feet very quickly because it's very boggy and it's raining so you have to kind of wear an outer layer but then you get hot underneath it. Uh, now walking on a compass bearing. So this is where I'm just putting the center of the needle, that bubble's really annoying. See, I actually lost orientation already there. Feels to me like I was starting to go too far left. So we actually want to go that way. For the first 10 minutes while I was navigating with a compass, it just didn't seem to be behaving properly. And then I realized the GoPro magnetic mounts that I have on my chest were actually affecting the compass and making it swing 180 degrees out. So I must've got a little bit off track during that first 10 minutes. So much better with that. Hold on. That tastes so good. What do you got, Tom? Mars bar. It is uh, windy and we need somewhere to have lunch and we just found this little, I wouldn't call it a cave, but it's a gap between two rocks. Spot, eh? Pretty unlikely to find a place like this up here. All right, this wide out is just too difficult to navigate in, and uh, we're now soaked through most of our clothes. And if we just keep bundling on. We'll miss this pass and end up having a backtrack tomorrow when we can see where we're going. So we're going to find somewhere to set up the tent and camp. Despite wearing a waterproof outer layer, I'm still mostly wet on the inside now because it's been raining so much. So that's an important reason not to have cotton clothing because cotton is a vegetable fibre and it hangs onto moisture and is really hard to dry out. 
So I make sure I either have synthetic thermals or merino thermals, which are even better, because they dry more quickly and they can still provide warmth when they're wet. In this case, I didn't have enough merino thermals to go around, so I gave Tom and Zara my merino bottoms and I just used synthetic pants, which weren't quite as good, but at least they dry. So when you're wet in these situations, just wear your wet stuff to bed and after a few hours of feeling clammy, it eventually dries out. Luckily in the evening the rain stopped for a brief period and I jumped out and cooked some carbonara. I normally put the daily food rations in Ziploc bags and then once the first one of these is empty I use it for a rubbish bag and I find that's the easiest way to just keep a track of all the rubbish because you do end up with a lot of small bits of plastic rubbish on trips like this. Thank you. Better than yesterday. Oh, thumbs out again, yeah. Okay, we're ready to go. <laughs> and it's just wired out again. And we can now scope out our route to the top of Mount Tate which is up there, so we're just going to basically follow along the top of the ridge to the top there. That's where I was hoping to camp last night, but uh, we just couldn't see anything. With the cloud base starting to lift, I'm close to being able to see the first of the 10 highest peaks of Australia. I'm just hoping that the weather continues to improve. Crust with some cheese for lunch. And then the summit of Australia's third highest mountain, Mount Twynham, comes into view for the first time. Let's be honest here, due to the rounded nature of Australia's peaks due to the age of the Australian continent, we don't have such spectacular steep peaks as other countries. Maybe our claim to fame should be that it gets so windy that the trig markers blow over. On the plus side, at least we don't have to carry ice axes and crampons to our mountains. We can just stop and smell the flowers. Looking back behind us, I can see Mount Jagungal that we walked past and all the way back to Round Mountain where we started this hike. As a kid I used to come up here with my friends and camp next to these lakes late in the ski season and we'd ski the really extreme shoots surrounding these glacial lakes. But they've now banned that, you've got to camp outside of the catchment areas of the lakes so that's why I'm camped back outside of the catchment next to a path, not so glamorous but uh, just doing the right thing. But I also read on the sign next to this lake that it was 26 metres deep and me and my mate lugged up scuba gear and tried to scuba dive to the bottom of this lake but we had gear failure on our dry seats and it didn't quite work out. But anyway, I do love these mountains and there's plenty of adventure to be found if you know where to look. As we were packing up camp, these four drives turned up and I thought, oh geez, I'm not getting busted for some, am I? Turns out it's rangers doing a hawkweed program where they're trying to eradicate this species of invasive weed and we've been seeing these signs right across the top of the snowies as we walked and these guys have got sniffer dogs that are specially trained to sniff out this weed and they're hoping that they can completely eradicate it and therefore no longer have to manage it. Either that or it's an elaborate cover story for a drug bust that's about to go down so it's time to get out of here. This is my favourite part of the main range. We're walking along the highest section of ridge all the way towards Mount Kosciuszko, our highest peak. 
On the way, we're bagging Carruthers Peak, one of the top 10. And I'm hoping the wind's going to drop down. So if you look at a synoptic chart, here's our position. We have these isobars, and around a high-pressure system, the winds travel in an anti-clockwise direction. Around a low, they travel in a clockwise direction. And the closer these isobars are, the stronger the wind is. So you can see they're close together here, and that's where we are. That's why it was windy yesterday. That's yesterday's chart. Then the isobars are getting further apart, the wind's dropping, dropping again. And by tonight, I'm hoping the wind's going to be completely still, and we're going to have one of those perfect snowy mountains clear nights. Australia had glaciers 12,000 years ago during the last ice age and they dug out these depressions which have now formed lakes. Lake Albina is another glacier lake and we're now on the metal walkway that extends a lot of the way to Threadbow and it's designed to minimise impact on the environment but also help people find their way back in the middle of a whiteout. People do die up here from exposure, from getting lost in whiteouts. And they also die from avalanches, believe it or not. There was a hut at the base of this mountain and it was destroyed with someone in it and they died in an avalanche many years ago. That's Cozzy over there, highest. We just come from Twynham, Carruthers, which are like the third and then I don't know, the sixth or something. We're going to dump our packs and bag these peaks next. Uh, Abbott Peak East, number nine. This is the eighth highest. Abbott Peak. What lake is that? That's the highest I've ever seen deer prints. I can't think of too many peaks in the snowies that I haven't climbed. This is the first time I've climbed this one, Alice Rawson Peak. And I reckon it has the best view anywhere in the snowy mountains. Because you can see way back to Cozzy. You can see obviously way out west into Victoria, New South Wales. That's kind of like Murray River coming in towards Can Coburn. And then you can see Watson's Crags, the Sentinel, and all of the best steep skiing and gnarly terrain in Australia. Mount Twynham, and you can see all the way over to Charlotte's and the track all the way back to Cozzy, all from one spot. So this is the best view in Australia, I reckon, for mountains. It's day six and we're all getting sick of packet meals and we can't wait to eat something fresh. After pushing through some pretty rubbish conditions, it was nice to have absolutely perfect weather like this for the last night of the trip. And little surprises kept coming out of nowhere, like the fact you could fill water bottles from pools on the rocks at the top of the mountain due to the recent rains. The next surprise was something I just completely wasn't expecting. So some good news, can you see the moths flying around? There's a whole bunch of moths flying around, like thousands and thousands, and I'm guessing they're bogong moths. And they've had a real struggle, they're these moths that go and they breed out on the Western Plains and they hatch and they come up here and they land in the high country and Aboriginal people used to come up here specifically to harvest them. They taste pretty good raw and cooked. They taste like sort of nut, they have a nutty flavor. And I hadn't seen any on this trip so far, but now I'm seeing thousands of them flying around. Now, normally, like you, you can barely breathe when they're really thick, but at least I'm seeing some. I'll see if I can get a close up of one. So the floor of this cave is carpeted in dead ones. It has a bit of a smell like back guano because they're full of protein, these things. That's why they taste good and why original people ate them. And they would, they'd smoke them out and they'd just like gather up masses of them. There's been a real failure of the bogongs in the last few years. I think it's because of the conditions out in the Western Plains where they breed. Uh, also, man-made light sources is making life hard for them. I just want to find out where all these live ones are going. Bingo. I can see where they're landing. I can see their eyes. Oh, yes. <laughs> the bogong moth population has crashed so badly recently that they were added to the threatened species list in 2021. That's why I'm not eating them. So it's really good to see these guys cracking on with life the way that they always have. Point of 
kilometers and there's something cross. So here's an all night star lapse looking south at Mount Kosciuszko and it's a good chance to show the most common way to find south in the southern hemisphere from the stars. So you extend a line through the middle of the southern cross and another line through the middle of the pointers and where they intersect is roughly where the south celestial pole is. Unlike the northern hemisphere we don't have a star there unfortunately so we have to estimate where it is. From the south celestial pole drop a line to the horizon and that's where south is. You can see as the universe continues to turn that the Southern Cross and pointers keep pointing to the South Celestial Pole. Often clouds or the horizon obscure the Southern Cross and the pointers so it's good to have a few other techniques. Another one I use is Archana and Canopus making an equilateral triangle and the other point is the South Celestial Pole. Once again, because there's no actual star at the South Celestial Pole, they're all approximations but they'll still get you within a few degrees of South. Seriously, it took me five attempts to spell that correctly. I wasn't expecting this on the top of Mount Kosciuszko. <laughs> I could see a tractor from the bottom, so they're obviously doing track works up here. Some numpty vandalised the can on top a while ago, they're probably replacing that as well. And then, like a complete numpty, I left my camera in hyperlapse mode, so it's all in fast forward and you can't hear anything I'm saying, but basically I point out the three remaining peaks to the south that we've got to complete before we walk out to Threadbow. Yeah, like that. Good one, bunny rabbit. Alright, this one's North Ramshead. I was one meter off. My hands are full, I'm just filming at the moment. I wasn't sure if we'd take the chairlift or not, but uh, it's been a long walk, seven days. So we're taking it and we're gonna meet the doggy and my mum in the car down the bottom. How good. Going on there. Did you yeah. stay overnight? Yeah, seven nights, yeah. Seven nights? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Alrighty. There's my mum and the doggy's gonna be in the car. He's gonna go nuts. But he can't get out of the car because it's a national park. There he is. Ollie! Hello Puffy! Hello Puffy! Oh it's oh, so good to hello. see you. I'll just get this door He's shut. smiling. He's smiling, good boy. Oh, we missed you, Bubby. We missed you. <laughs> Look at him. Oh, good boy. Good boy. Oh, welcome. That's enough, thanks. Alrighty, hope you enjoyed that hike. Uh, it was good. Uh, feel free to subscribe, and uh, more adventures coming soon.